gunfire in the streets of Kabul after a protest led by women angry over the Taliban rule in Afghanistan. One protester saying people need to express their anger. Men and women, they must not stay silent. All this comes as here in America we begin a solemn week to mark 20 years since September 11th. And it has really come full circle in Afghanistan with the Taliban now in charge again. Our special preview of a series all week airing on ABC News Live. I guarantee you every veteran that's serving Iraq and Afghanistan is having a lot harder time sleeping tonight and largely because they feel like 20 years of their life of these diplomas they made were virtually thrown out in, in, in an instant. And our conversation with the only reporter who was traveling that day with President George W. Bush, what it was like to be on the front lines of history. The president looked out the window of Marine One at the burning Pentagon, and he told the person next to him, this is what war looks like in the 21st century. The major concern tonight after the Labor Day holiday, what you should be doing to protect you and your family, and what doctors are saying tonight about the massive rise in COVID cases among children, 252,000 just here in the U.S. in the past week alone. President Biden tonight visiting the New York metro area disaster zones, dozens killed in the historic rainfall and flash flooding. The president blaming the dangers of climate change, warning we're living through it now. We don't have any more time. Time, what action he wants taken immediately. Honoring an award-winning actor. Tonight, the tribute's coming in for Michael K. Williams, who died one of his most famous roles as Omar in the hit TV show, The Wire. The touching words from his co-star about what he meant to him. In one of the world's most extreme places, the eco-friendly competition, just a stone's throw from the Arctic Circle. Our James Longman was there. Oh my God, my head is like a pinball. I was just bouncing between the two parts of the sea. Poor James there. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We begin tonight with the growing post-Labor Day fears and the latest grim milestone, 40 million total COVID cases in America. And now with school underway, there's major concern tonight about a shocking rise in pediatric cases. Roughly 252,000 cases among children reported in just the past week. This comes as many schools are still trying to figure out their COVID restrictions and rules. And as cases continue to surge among unvaccinated Americans, Americans nationwide. One official in hard hit Idaho saying tonight, if we had everyone in the community vaccinated, we would not be in this position. The situation so bad, their med military medical support now has to assist with treating patients. And health officials fear it could get even worse. Crowded airports and Labor Day holiday travel could lead to the same kind of post holiday surges we saw in the beginning of this pandemic. And tonight there's concern about a new variant to watch that some researchers fear could possibly evade the vaccines. Our Marcus Moore leads us off. With millions of students going back to the classroom this week, health officials are warning COVID cases could skyrocket. Pediatric infections soaring to nearly 252,000 in just the last week, the biggest increase ever. We're calling this the fourth wave, but it has certainly been by far the most impactful surge, really hitting at children and adolescents. In Texas, where the governor has banned mask mandates in schools, a record number of children hospitalized with COVID. <laughs> 11-year-old Brenna Gerganis wound up fighting for her life on a ventilator. She was too young to get vaccinated, and her mom says she got COVID just days after going back to her Texas classroom. Her lungs were going through hell. They've been doing breathing treatments on her every four hours. Thankfully, Brenna made it home where she is recovering tonight. COVID cases have already forced closures in at least 1,400 schools across 35 states this school year, and the battle over mask mandates still raging. No more masks! No more masks! We've got to get the school system masked in addition to surrounding the children with that with vaccinated people. That's the solution. But after Labor Day weekend saw big crowds and thousands packed into football stadiums, health officials are bracing for more outbreaks. I don't think it's smart. I think when you're dealing particularly in if you know outdoors is always better than indoors. But even when you have such a congregate setting of people close together, first, you should be vaccinated. And when you do have congregate settings, particularly indoors, 
you should be wearing a mask. The country now seeing nearly four times the number of COVID cases and double the number of hospitalizations than a year ago when there was no vaccine. But ICUs are now overwhelmed with unvaccinated patients. They're so sick they actually can't breathe and you see the fear in their eyes. Sometimes they mutter. I wish I would have been vaccinated. In northern Idaho, hospitals activating crisis care as a last resort, meaning life-saving equipment may not be available. And tonight, health officials are closely tracking a new variant, first identified in Colombia, called Mu, with mutations suggesting it could slightly evade vaccines. For now, the vaccines are still effective against it, but Mu has been confirmed in at least 16 states, with the most cases in California. While we have a concern that Mu could evade the vaccine, it's not spreading fast enough to be a real concern yet, but the jury is still out. Keeping an eye on this new variant, Marcus Moore joins us now. Marcus, we're expecting to hear, of course, from the president Thursday about how he plans to stop the spread of the Delta variant as well as on booster shots. Dr. Fauci weighed in on that as well today. What did he have to say? Yeah, he did. He said that a third shot of the mRNA vaccines dramatically increased the level of protection and that he believes ultimately the uh, three shots will become the standard regimen uh, down the line. Lindsay. Marcus Moore, our thanks to you. Now to the fallout tonight after that deadly flooding disaster and historic rain on the East Coast. President Biden visiting the metro New York area today to survey the damage and talk with affected residents, calling the destruction an eye-opener. Biden making it very clear storms like Ida show the threat from climate change is everybody's crisis. Our Whit Johnson reports. Tonight, President Biden touring disaster zones in New York and New Jersey meeting with people whose lives were devastated by the remnants of Hurricane Ida. The losses uh, that we witnessed today are profound. A catastrophic storm killing at least 52 people in the Northeast alone, dropping historic rainfall in New York City, more than three inches falling in one hour. The president making the case that these extreme weather events require urgent action on climate change and calling this an opportunity to harden America's infrastructure. The evidence clear. Climate change poses an existential mm -hmm. threat to our lives, to our economy, and the threat is here. It's not going to get any better. The question, can it get worse? We can stop it from getting worse. But New York City still reeling from the horror of this storm. Many of the victims dying while trapped in flooded basements. The NYPD releasing this dramatic video showing the desperate effort to rescue a family, including a toddler in Queens. They did not survive. In New Jersey, where three tornadoes touched down and flooding destroyed homes, the search continues for at least four people swept away in raging water, including two college students, 18-year-old Nidhi Rana and 20-year-old Ayush Rana of Passaic. Missing for nearly a week, family members hoping for a miracle. Please pray for them, pray for them, please. Everybody pray for them. And nine days after Ida slammed into Louisiana as a monster Category 4 storm, then hard hit Golden Meadow. I've been here since 1966. Long time. 80 year old Gerald Louvier is yes. one of many residents yes. still vowing to rebuild. This is home, and it'll always be home. <laughs> Am I going to move? No. Just got to fight through it. And uh, we'll do it. Many planning to stick it out there. Whit Johnson joins us now from Queens, New York, where President Biden spoke earlier. And with the president today sounding the alarm that climate change is real and that it is here now, what does he want Congress to do about it? Lindsay, President Biden called this an eye opener, saying climate change is everybody's crisis. And he's doubling down on his push for Congress to pass his massive infrastructure package, not only to help rebuild now, but to be better prepared for extreme weather threats in the future. Lindsay. With Johnson, our thanks to you. Overseas tonight, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken promises the U.S. is working round the clock to help about 100 Americans still in Afghanistan to get out. It comes as the Taliban appoints a new caretaker government. This is today brave women took to the streets in Kabul protesting Taliban rule. ABC's chief global affairs correspondent Martha Raddatz reports. 
The chartered planes have been sitting empty on the tarmac at this airport in northern Afghanistan for more than a week, nearly 600 people waiting to board. And despite the Taliban's promise to allow Americans safe passage, for the first time tonight, the Secretary of State confirming there are a small number of Americans among the group stopped by the Taliban. They have said that those without valid documents at this point can't leave, but because all of these people are grouped together, um, that's meant uh, that uh, flights have not been, uh, been allowed to go. Secretary Blinken joining Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin in Qatar, promising he will work around the clock to assure Americans are able to leave. In Kabul, the Taliban firing shots into the air to disperse mostly female protesters demanding their rights be protected. And tonight, more details on this Texas mother and her three children who escaped Afghanistan overland with help from the State Department and a nonprofit. Oklahoma Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen says they traveled 300 miles through 20 Taliban checkpoints at each one, paying $500 to $4,000 per person. Making it out safely in the end. Martha Raddatz joins us now. Martha, the Taliban releasing more details late today about their new proposed government. It appears to really fall short of their promise to be more inclusive. What are you learning about this new government? It, it sure does fall short, Lindsay. First of all, they are all members of the Taliban, and it certainly does not include any women. But it does include people with ties to terrorism, including the new Minister of the Interior, who has a $5 million FBI price tag on his head because of affiliation with terrorist groups. And that includes al-Qaeda, Lindsay. And, and Martha, is it possible that we might start to see American officials working with this new Taliban government to do things like try to get those remaining? Americans back. Well, I, I think you'll certainly see them work with the Taliban government to get those Americans back and many Afghans who want to get out of there as well. I think they really are trying to do that now in some way. But as for recognizing them, President Biden has said that's a long way off. Lindsay? Martha Raddatz, thank you so much. And nearly 20 years after 9-11, a pretrial hearing is now underway at the Guantanamo Bay detention camp for the alleged 9-11 mastermind and four accused conspirators. But the case faces challenges after the enhanced interrogation methods used on the defendants at CIA black site prisons after their arrest. ABC News senior national correspondent Terry Moran has the very latest. Tonight, nearly 20 years after the attacks on 9-11, the long wait for justice continues. The pretrial hearing beginning today at Guantanamo Bay for five men accused in the plot that killed nearly 3,000 people. The lead defendant, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, called the principal architect of the 9-11 attacks in the 9-11 Commission report. KSM, as he was dubbed by the agents who tracked him down, was captured in Pakistan in 2003. In 2007, he confessed in a statement to the Combatant Status Review Tribunal saying, I was responsible for the 9-11 operation from A to Z. But before the trial begins, the judge must also decide what evidence can be admitted. The defense team arguing that the men on trial were tortured, subjected to brutal interrogation techniques, and that their accounts and that confession are in question. The CIA has admitted to subjecting Khalid Sheikh Mohammed to repeated waterboarding, a technique that simulates drowning. And this trial has been held up for nearly a decade for the survivors and family members of the victims. It's a process that has taken far too long. 22-year-old Patricia Smith lost her mother, Moira Smith, in the attacks on September 11th. She was the only female NYPD officer to die that day. Justice delayed is justice denied. And now we're 20 years later with no justice. Still seeking justice after two decades. Terry Moran joins us now. Terry, it's been 20 years since the 9-11 attack. Just explain why some of those complicating factors have led to this process just now starting to get underway. It is taking so long, Lindsay. There's no question. That's frustrating, not just to the family members, the victims, but to so many Americans, all of us really, who are looking for justice. And there are several reasons. Well, one is the pandemic slowed everything down. But the main reason is what you might call the original sin. The decision under the Bush administration by the president himself to take these high-value al-Qaeda leaders out of the American legal system and torture them and then try to put them back in. 
in this new invention of these military commissions. Ultimately, the federal courts get involved, and it is going to be very hard to secure convictions for these defendants under these circumstances. And so that has stretched everything out, because at the beginning and end of every discussion about this trial is, you know, how can you try people that were tortured for years? And that's really why it's taken so long. Terry Moran, our thanks to you. Now to Texas, where Governor Greg Abbott has signed that sweeping new voting law after months of delay after Democratic legislators fled the state to deny Republicans a quorum. Texas is now the latest of more than a dozen states to restrict voting measures in the name of security after the 2020 election. Here's ABC's chief White House correspondent, Cecilia Vega. Today in Texas... Election integrity is now law in the state of Texas. Governor Greg Abbott signing some of the most sweeping voting restrictions in the country. We must have trust and confidence in our elections. But in Texas and every other state, there has been no evidence of widespread voter fraud. Still, the new law bans drive through voting and 24 hour polling locations, which have increased turnout among minorities. It prevents election officials from sending mail in ballot applications to voters who haven't formally requested them. This comes just one week after Texas enacted the most sweeping abortion law in the nation, banning the procedure as early as the sixth week of pregnancy before many women even know they are pregnant. Doris Dixon, who works at a Planned Parenthood in Houston, telling our Rachel Scott about one patient seeking an abortion who then tested positive for COVID. She was told she had to quarantine for 14 days, but by that point, she would be more than six weeks pregnant and unable to get an abortion under the new law. To hear her beg for someone to help her was hard. Um, she was begging. She was begging. Today, Governor Abbott pressed on why the law makes no exception for rape or incest. His answer, it's not needed because the state will eliminate the crime of rape altogether. Texas will work tirelessly to make sure that we eliminate all rapists from the streets of Texas by aggressively going out and uh, arresting them and prosecuting them and getting them off the streets. So goal number one in the state of Texas is to eliminate rape so that no woman, no person will be a victim of rape. Governor Abbott has not called on lawmakers to take up any new rape prevention legislation. And as of tonight, many women who are raped and become pregnant in Texas will not be able to get an abortion. Cecilia Vega joins us now from the White House. Cecilia, President Biden has said that he wants the Justice Department to look into what can be done to stop the abortion law in Texas. Any update on what that might mean? Uh, well, Lindsay, what we know, uh, the press secretary said today that multiple agencies within the government, including the White House, the Justice Department, the Department of Health and Human Services, they are all working to try to find some kind of legal avenue to challenge this. The attorney general himself says that he is urgently exploring all legal options to challenge this. But as we have been saying for days now, this law is extremely unique. It is extremely complicated. They have yet to find the avenue to do this. The press secretary said today they are still kicking the tires. Lindsay, I'm just going to tell you because it is exceptionally loud here. That's the President Marine One just landing here at the White House. That's what you're hearing behind me. <laughs> we appreciate that update. And, and we're also just hearing from Governor Abbott. He just announced a new special session. What's on the agenda? Yeah, this is a really big deal, Lindsay. Listen to what he's going to tackle on this one. We're talking about youth, uh, trans youth in sports, redist redistricting, vaccine mandates, certainly some hot button, very political issues. Once again, Texas at the forefront of so many of these heated political issues that we are seeing around the country in that Republican-led legislature. They're leading the way for, con for these laws that have a sweeping consequences. You're right. The Lone Star State really making some waves there. Cecilia Vega reporting in from the White House. Thanks so much, Cecilia. When we come back, anger and joy after six Palestinian prisoners dig their way out of an Israeli jail in this hole. We're on the ground in Greenland documenting the extreme race aimed at warning us about our changing world. But up next, our nation was changed forever by 9-11. But what about the changes to the brave men and women who fought for us in the war against terror? Stay with us. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. 
What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Right now, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. This is what being live is Please all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people. Squeezing, squeezing into this bomb movie. shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. Streaming straight to you, anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. Outrage in Israel, jubilation in many neighborhoods in the Palestinian occupied territories. This is the manhunt for six high security Palestinian prisoners who exploited security lapses and escaped continues. The break allegedly took months of planning and dozens of checkpoints have now been set up as officials fear some or all of the group may have escaped into Jordan. In the wake of 9-11, America certainly became a different country. The wars we waged in Iraq and Afghanistan fundamentally impacted us all, and the servicemen and women who fought for our nation. Now that 20 years have passed and the wars have drawn to a close, we take a look back in our new documentary series at what it all means. Here's a sneak preview. At 9-11, 20 years later, the longest shadow. Good evening, everyone. I'm Lindsay Davis. We are coming on the air at this hour with the breaking developments overseas, the fall of Afghanistan. The Taliban just come to Kabul. The chaos, the panic, the desperation that you're seeing down at the airport. U.S. officials saying at least three people were run over and killed by the tires. Local reports saying people could be seen falling from the plane as it departed. This is the mirror image of 9-11, the falling man who jumped out of the Twin Towers trying to escape. It's, um, I mean, if, if somebody were writing this as fiction, it would almost be too much. Some of it is not surprising. All of it's disappointing. I don't think anyone should have been under any illusions that the country wasn't going to collapse. It's one thing to pull out, but pulling out without a plan in place is unforgivable. I guarantee you, every veteran that's serving Iraq and Afghanistan is having a lot harder time sleeping tonight, and largely because they feel like 20 years of their life of these deployments they made were virtually thrown out in, in, a, in an instant.
we will pursue nations that provide aid or safe haven to terrorism. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. In the days after 9-11, our intelligence agencies concluded that the uh, nerve system of Al-Qaeda had, had come out of Afghanistan. Afghanistan was the place where Osama bin Laden found refuge. They had a series of training camps there, and they planned the attack on the United States from Afghanistan. That was the place that harbored the terrorists that attacked us. So this was not just retaliation, but to prevent more attacks, that we had to go into Afghanistan. Go, come on, come on, come on! Come on! And so it has begun. The battle, as the president put it, has now been joined. 2,977 people were killed on September 11th. And in the wake of the worst terror attack on America, U.S. public support was firmly behind President Bush and his administration to go after those responsible. We will not only deal with those who dare attack America, we will deal with those who harbor them. We went into Afghanistan and eventually found ourselves trapped uh, in a, a terrorist war. My entire adult life has been spent in the shadow of the Twin Towers falling. It's unimaginable to me what my life would have been like had that not happened. I almost certainly went to join the Army. I gave up everything for, to do that. Um, I mean, that was my 20s, right? I gave up, uh, you know, my time, my youth, my health. Lauren Crow was 25 years old when he was commissioned as an infantry officer in the Army. By the time he was sent to Afghanistan, the U.S. was seven years into the war on terror. I was a platoon leader in charge of 30-some-odd infantry guys and some support soldiers. We were placed on a, our own combat outpost, sort of right up against the Pakistan border, the furthest outpost in our battalion from the battalion headquarters in the Pash River Valley. I hated the Pesh. I hated that we were there. That terrain is sort of like none other. Everything is always up. You're literally fighting uphill. We were really a bunch of new lieutenants, a bunch of new privates who'd come straight out from basic training in Fort Benning, and a whole lot of insurgents. If I had any high-minded ideals about joining the Army or you know, fighting for country and democracy, not, not given that up. The job was to hold on. We really relied on initiative from wherever we could find it. So when you found someone who could step into a role, you needed that person in that role. And Brandon Farley was one of those people. Brandon was shot and killed on a mission in a close ambush um, in Kunar in September of 2008. It was a pretty standard patrol. We were done with our mission for the day, coming back and close to a spot where a unit had been ambushed earlier. We had aircraft overhead, helicopters watching out for us. So felt pretty safe, about 40 minutes of driving and we'd be back. When all of a sudden I got a call over the radio that our helicopters had checked off station to go refuel. They left and not 10 seconds later, my Humvee pulled around the corner and saw the Humvee that Sergeant Farley was in just getting lit up by everything you could imagine. He was killed almost immediately. He was working as a gunner that day. So he was up in the gunner's hatch. It's the worst day of my life, by far, and hopefully remains so, because I can't imagine going through anything worse than this. I took it as a personal failure. My job was to keep him alive. Nobody should have died there. Nobody needed to die there. Come on, come on. 
I don't think I ever saw a greater strategic purpose for being there. Hold on is not a reason to send people across the world to take gunfire. He's right over there. There's openings in the windows. Gunner! We need to get out. Everyone volunteers knowing that they will put their life on the line at some point, or they're at least willing to. Um, asking people to do that, it's a sacred obligation, and there needs to be a reason why. You need to be able to look soldiers in the eye and say, this is why we're asking you to go and take this risk. Um, and if you can't do that, then what you're doing, asking them to do that, is fratricide. It's, it's taken me a long time to get there, but um, death without reason. Death without reason, so much loss and sacrifice from those brave men and women. You can see more from our series special, 9-11, 20 years later, the longest shadow anchored by George Stephanopoulos running all week on ABC News Live at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, 9.30 Pacific, and also on Hulu. And be sure to tune in Saturday morning on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. I'll be with the team for special live coverage from Ground Zero starting at 8 a.m. Eastern. Still ahead here on Prime tonight, a deepening murder mystery, why a prominent South Carolina attorney resigned from his family's law firm and is apologizing after his wife and son were gunned down. ABC News legend Ann Compton joins us tonight. What it was like to be with the president as he watched the world change forever on 9-11. And why are there so many teens competing in the U.S. Open? We take a look by the numbers, but first our tweet of the day, actor Mark Ruffalo, or the Hulk, making sure people watch the credits for Marvel's latest smash hit, Shang-Chi. Everything was perfect until that moment. Now, 20 years after, our world forever changed. I was just praying. What'd you say to God? Please give me a second chance. The powerful stories that unite these women are the things miracles are made of. Sorry. Sorry, I just got like chills. Robin Roberts, the women of 9-11. Wednesday night, September 8th on ABC. This is what being live is Three all seconds. about. Five, this is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people this squeezing into this bomb shelter. shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Good job. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. The president of the United States is having an affair with an intern. Someone needs to go public. I promised him that I would not tell anyone. We just got to show him what really happened. Are you sure you have enough evidence? You are chaos. You are mayhem. These allegations are false. Mom, I'm in trouble. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any place else. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast, now streaming on ABC News Live. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. Right now, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. 
Welcome back, everyone. The U.S. Open Tennis Tournament here in New York City is getting into the home stretch, and the teenagers have taken over. We take a look by the numbers. Three, that's the number of teen tennis phenoms who have advanced to the U.S. Open quarterfinals over the Labor Day weekend in the men's and women's singles bracket. That's the first time that's happened at the U.S. Open since 2001, when four teens made to the round of 16, including a 19-year-old Serena Williams. 18-year-old Carlos Alcaraz advanced to the quarters in his debut at the U.S. Open, becoming the youngest men's player to reach the quarter since 1963, the youngest U.S. Open player ever to beat a top three opponent, advancing with two marathon five-set victories along the way. Britain's Emma Raducanu, ranked 150 in the world heading into the tournament, has not lost a set yet in her march to the round of 16. And Canadian Layla Fernandez, who turned 19 just on Sunday, has bested some of the world's top women including defending U.S. Open champ Naomi Osaka. And with her win today, Fernandez becomes the youngest player in 16 years to reach the U.S. Open semifinals. But don't count out the elders just yet. 34-year-old Novak Djokovic is the only player over the age of 30 still in the draw as he tries to complete a calendar year Grand Slam by winning all four major tournaments in 2021. Good luck to all the players. And we still have lots to get to here on Prime tonight. Why Howard University rushed to cancel all of its classes and hint it's not because of the weather and the tributes continue pouring in for actor Michael K. Williams but first a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com world news now and America this morning the best new video the breaking news overnight emergency crews called to the town of Surfside US airstrikes hitting targets in Iraq and Syria the stories people are talking about you don't want to shave your legs don't I was gonna say, oh my God. and what to expect in the day ahead ABC World News now and America this morning starting at 2 a.m. Eastern up all night to keep you up to date it's an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier Podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Right now, with so much at stake, thank you for making ABC's This Week with George the number one Sunday morning news show versus the competition. Welcome to This Week. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. COVID cases continue to surge around the U.S., the Delta variant targeting unvaccinated communities, including a growing number of children as they head back to the classroom. At least 45 school districts in Texas already have switched back to remote learning. The state reporting nearly 52,000 cases among students since the school year began. Pennsylvania's statewide school mask mandate goes into effect today. Still parents in places like Pittsburgh protesting masks. Texas's highly controversial voting rights bill now is law, even after Democrats fled the state to keep it from passing. One thing that all Texans can agree, and that is that we must have trust and confidence in our elections. Called the Election Integrity Priority Bill, or SB1, state Republicans argue it makes it easier to vote by expanding the required early voting hours. Critics point to the law's added restrictions. It bans drive through and overnight early voting, something popular in heavily Democrat-leaning Harris County. It also adds new ID requirements for absentee voting. The move comes partly in response to former President Trump's false claims that the presidential election was stolen. The American Civil Liberties Union and other voting rights groups have already filed lawsuits challenging the new law. 
No class for students today at Howard University due to a cyber attack. The university says there's been no evidence that personal data has been stolen. Just last week, the FBI and Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency warned companies to be vigilant and on alert for ransomware attacks that could occur over Labor Day weekend. A deepening murder mystery in South Carolina where a man from a prominent legal family was shot months after his wife and son were gunned down. Alec Murdoch, whose wife and son were brutally murdered in June, putting out a statement after he says someone shot him this weekend, saying, the murders of my wife and son have caused an incredibly difficult time in my life. I have made a lot of decisions that I truly regret. I'm resigning from my law firm and entering rehab after a long battle that has been exacerbated by these murders. I'm immensely sorry to everyone I've hurt, including my family, friends, and colleagues. After months of teaching remotely, First Lady Dr. Jill Biden resumes in-person classes today at Northern Virginia Community College, where she's been teaching writing and English since 2009. She is the first First Lady to have a full-time job outside the White House while residing there. Omar, isn't it? He was the Emmy-nominated star best known for his roles as Omar Little on the hit shows The Wire and Chonky White on Boardwalk Empire. Hey, everywhere you just hear. Michael K. Williams found dead inside his Brooklyn home on Monday. Police not commenting on the cause of death, only saying that drug paraphernalia was found in his home. Williams has long been vocal about his struggles with sobriety, sitting down with Tamron Hall earlier this year. A lot of people often think that when a person puts down the drug or the alcohol that all the problems go away, that, that couldn't be further from the truth. The Wire creator wrote on Twitter that he was too gutted right now to say all that ought to be said. Michael was a fine man and a rare talent, and on our journey together, he always deserved the best words. And today, those words won't come. What up, what up, what up, what up? Off-screen, Williams gave back. He co-founded Crew Count, a community-led organization working to empower over police communities. And we are reaching out to the same people, same young people that are being put on these gang databases and we are educating them and they are being activated. He is currently nominated for an Emmy for his role in Lovecraft Country. Michael K. Williams was 54. Welcome back everyone. Now to the extreme race that took place on the steps of the Arctic on purpose. Why? James Longman traveled to Greenland and files this in-depth report. In the far reaches of the Arctic and the silence of this icy desert, a new special kind of race is raging, where the roar of the engine is replaced by the hum of the motor and the buzz of a battery. Extreme E is an all-electric super truck race with a mission, shining a light on environmental crises. From desert dunes to ocean beaches, Extreme E goes around the world on this specially kitted out ship to make tackling climate change cool. And its coolest spot yet, Greenland. But the Arctic is actually warming faster than anywhere else on Earth. That's why these racers are doing battle at the foot of the melting Russell Glacier. Jump in and swap out. And another unique feature, men and women compete together, a motorsport first. For Team USA, Sarah Price, usually a champion of gas-guzzling monster trucks, this Californian speed demon is facing her most extreme challenge yet, competing for legendary US racing team, Chip Ganassi. It is usually a male-dominated sport, and I'd say, you know, in a room of 100, there's one female, but one thing that is great about driving is that there is no gender difference. We're all equal when we get into a car. So when you put a helmet on, we're racers. Not a female, not a male, we're a racer. Perhaps against her better judgment, she let me have a go. I'm going to have a go, very slowly, and then she's going to scare the living Jesus out of me. That's what's going to happen now, I think. Look at this, you can see the stars and stripes up the side of the car. How much more American do you want to get? Good. I notice a small yellow button on the steering wheel. So I've just seen hyperdrive on this uh, steering wheel. What is it? So hyperdrive is our favorite thing as racers in this series. It gives us complete power of the battery in the car for four seconds during the race. I love how they've, they've literally taped over the button for hyperdrive for me. They've looked at me and gone, no hyperdrive for you. Driving this massive beast, oh, oh my God, with no engine sound, was wild. <laughs> that was so fun! 
was amazing. You killed it. Awesome. But nothing compared to the pro. Oh my god, my head is like a pinball. I was just bouncing between the two parts of the sea. You are nuts! <laughs> She's crazy! It was amazing, amazing, amazing. What an experience. Ooh. And the best thing is, she pressed hyperdrive. And then we were like... <laughs> that was so cool. Sarah's partner is off-road pro Carl LeDuc. Originally skeptical about electric, he's in it to win it now. I think what you're going to see come out of the U.S. is the U.S. version <laughs> of, you know, like this. It's a, it's a truck now. It's one of the first initial super trucks. So we're going to show you guys what a big, gnarly, heavy, off-road capable electric truck looks like instead of what the normal is. But this isn't some crazy experiment. Extreme has a science committee with experts from Oxford and Cambridge universities and supports community outreach. It's got big money behind it and even bigger names. F1 champion Jensen Button has a team. So does Nico Rosberg, Sebastian Loeb and Carlos Sainz are behind the wheel and F1 legend Lewis Hamilton. The fact that we face this climate issue, the fact that we're going to these different locations and speaking and raising awareness, for me was the, the real eye catcher. And then on top of that, we are naturally advancing technology. I never thought that I would drive an electric car and because I love the sound and the roar and all that stuff. And then as soon as I actually got an electric car, I have now like three different electric cars and I'm so converted because the power, the, the, the power to ratio, uh, to weight ratio is insane. And now on top of that, my knowledge of what the impact we are having on the planet. So now I wanna be a part of shifting that that, uh, that technology forward. And it's not just shifting technology forward, but racing culture. Edward Telvin runs Segi, a main US sponsor. Not to put too fine a point on it, but racing in Europe, racing in the United States, these are kind of white sports. Is that a motivation for you to try to change that up? 100%. As much as we're here racing, and as much as we're here talking about the reason why we're racing, which is the planet, this is also about diversity, it's also about inclusion, and it's also about representing the underrepresented. If young black kids can go to school and study to be part of this, then they can see that we're doing it, and then they can do it too. And that's really what it's all about. Seeing is doing. That's the battery there. Is all this completely carbon neutral? No. Teams fly in from around the world, and the logistics mean it can't be completely carbon free yet. But that is the aim. In an effort to keep emissions low, the St. Helena transports the entire race, the cars, support vehicles, and infrastructure. Greenland was our first choice. The whole climate change, if we were to find the, 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 the center of the problem, is probably here. The Arctic is melting, the ice cap here is melting, and that's uh, causing a change reaction of, of consequences that you can feel everywhere else. So what's all this powered by? Well, liquid hydrogen, a cutting edge fuel that could change the way we all drive in the future. So this is fueling the whole thing. This is where the energy comes yes, from. Yes, yes. And, and what, what's really interesting is, is hydrogen is 100% clean. And, you know, we've got green hydrogen. So we actually make our hydrogen on site using, oh, these are solar, panels. using solar panels. So, so the energy from, from the sun, effectively, the, the Arctic sun, mm -hmm. is creating green hydrogen. Um, and then we charge the cars using green hydrogen, and the only byproduct that we have from that is water, which we then use to wash the cars. So we have this, oh, this circular sort of effect here. So how did Team USA do? Well, these monster truck drivers don't hold back and crashed out before the final. Wow, it just rips off. And the celebrations of the winning pair from Andretti, another US outfit, underscored what all this is all about. They're standing in knee-deep meltwater. James Long for ABC News in Greenland. Really fascinating stuff, including that hyperdrive. Our thanks to James for bringing us that. Finally tonight, as we mark 20 years since the 9-11 attacks that changed history, former ABC News correspondent Ann Compton experienced that history like few others, traveling on board Air Force One, covering then-President Bush as the day unfolded. So I recently had a chance to speak with Ann about her reflections and what 9-11 means 20 years later. 
We just got a report in that there's been some sort of explosion at the World Trade Center. It was just minutes before Good Morning America was supposed to end on September 11th, 2001. We don't know if it would have been deliberate or accidental. We know so little now. But the hours ahead would become a day no one would ever forget. We just saw another plane coming in from the side. Our belief at the moment is that an aircraft has crashed into either the courtyard itself or into that particular side of the building. There is simply no way to accurately describe the emotion this evokes. Anchor Peter Jennings and ABC News correspondents across the country were there to guide us through the day. I was actually in the subway heading towards the World Trade Center right around Franklin Street and after the first explosion the subway station started to fill with smoke. I was told by one of the White House staffers that their security official came in and said everybody should leave in an orderly fashion and about a minute later an agent ran in and said just run. A number of sources told me tonight that uh, a number of passengers and flight attendants were able to dial 911 and also reach some of their relatives. If you're a parent, you got a kid in some other part of the country, call them up. As the day unfolded, one correspondent was there to update us on then President George W. Bush. Dan Compton, who's been with the president all day, is on on the phone. He and what skeleton staff are with him uh, down into an underground bunker where Ari Fleischer tells me the president is going to chair a National Security Council meeting. Anne was one of the few reporters on 9-11 on board Air Force One with no telling where the plane would go next. We took off in Air Force One from Florida where he first got word of this and we literally, Peter, have been flying at well over 40,000 feet. We are leaving and I where are you going, Annie? Peter, I have no idea. Peter, I think the most striking thing about today was the sense of being traveling with the President of the United States who was running with no place to hide. Now, 20 years later, Anne tells us what she remembers about that day in the skies above a nation under attack. Anne, if you can take us back to that day, Emma Booker Elementary in Sarasota, Florida, that morning, kind of replay those moments when someone comes in and whispers into to the president's ear. It was a quiet day, the last stop on a three-day trip. The agenda was education. He'd given the speech a million times. So in this innocent setting, running. Yes, running. I was stunned to see White House Chief of Staff Andy Card come into the classroom and whisper to the president. Nobody interrupts a president, even in front of a classroom of second graders. But what forced me to write down in my reporter's notebook, 9.07 a.m., Andy whispers, was the look on President Bush's face. There was a gravity to it that was stunning. Andy stepped back, and I caught his eye. We had heard there had been a plane crash, and I made the sign of an airplane with my hand. Andy Card nodded and put up two fingers. That was the confirmation that this wasn't some tragic accident. It strikes me that looking back 20 years later, what we know now is what the president knew at that moment and we did not. The president had already asked the intelligence community, what could Al Qaeda do to hurt Americans on US soil? And that whisper was his answer. When did the magnitude of the moment really hit you? Actually, at the school, those of us traveling with the president, and even the president himself, knew so much less than everybody else in the country. We weren't by a television set watching the first plane and watching the second plane. So I figured it was bad when the president stood up, said, excuse me, he went into the other room. We were rushed out of the school classroom, just the small travel pool that was in the back of the classroom, rushed out the door into a school parking lot. At what point did, did it really hit you as far as taking your reporter hat off and, and the implications of this as a, as a citizen? I don't think there was ever a moment when the emotional side, the personal fear side of this ever hit. Even when we raced off to the airport, boarded Air Force One, and as soon as we got on Air Force One, we learned the Pentagon had been hit. So we knew we weren't going back to Washington. I wasn't scared for us in the plane. I wasn't afraid for the president's safety. I was appalled and shocked and heartbroken for the people on the ground. 
And then take us back to the first time you get on the air with Peter Jennings, and you have just a few facts, and there's so much chaos. The only way I could file my pool reports to the rest of the White House press corps in Florida and to the world was to call into ABC News where they patched me immediately through to Peter Jennings live on the air. President Bush is here at the home of the Strategic Command. And I'm talking into a little Motorola clamshell flip phone, but it had pretty good signal. All I could tell Peter Jennings and the world was that the president said this was a parent terrorist attack. He was returning to Washington. But I also knew that the Secret Service takes any threat anywhere and assumes it is a diversionary tactic and the real target is the president of the United States. So at that moment, my job was to say, the president's safe, he's on move, he's going to be on the airplane, and we have no idea where we're going. And what was that like for you, being boarding Air Force One and then you're just flying, you don't know where? There was a sense of this was the fog of war. In this case, the fog was as thick as that smoke billowing through lower Manhattan by that point. We knew there were attacks on the building. We heard that the Pentagon was in flames. The fear was, how broad did this go? The enormity of it was absolutely lost on us because on Air Force One, the only information we had as we flew for hours was a hazy picture on the television screens that are embedded in the front bulkhead wall of each cabin on Air Force One. And the president, in his cabin up forward, was furious and frustrated. He had three secure phone lines, and the higher we flew for safety, the more of those lines deteriorated. One of the most telling quotes from the president came as we arrived back to Washington about seven o'clock at night, and the president looked out the window of Marine One at the burning Pentagon, and he told the person next to him, this is what war looks like in the 21st century. When you look back at, at your long career, September 11th is, is the most memorable? The Christmas day that the Soviet Union ceased to exist, and I spent all Christmas on the White House lawn reporting on that, is something that changed the geography, the geopolitical map of the globe. 9-11 was the day that marked, after already 25 years of covering Washington, a day in which I felt I had to pull in all my resources, keep my focus, and remember that this is the future, a defining moment for the entire nation. And it wasn't until seven o'clock that night when I got back to the White House, my pool duties were over. The president was about to address the nation. And I got an email from my kids at college who said their classmate, was on the 93rd floor of the first tower. And at that moment, I crumpled into my chair at the White House and I cried. It all had a human face. People often talked about in the aftermath and continue to the idea of we will not forget. What do you feel that Americans ought to remember on this 20th anniversary? On September 11th, the country came together in a way we hadn't seen in a long time, helping each other. Uh, there was a, a, a sense of trying to protect your neighbors, uh, take in people, uh, trying to preserve what was best about the society that we had that was under attack. I think if I could tell my grandchildren, who are preschool, uh, what they should know about America, and the impact of September 11th, is that this is a country that needs to pull together and act as one united, uh, united States and a society that upholds principles of democracy and fairness and freedom. And that has to be our core. And that's what the important lesson of two decades taught me and what I hope they can carry forward.
Our thanks to Ann Compton for sharing her front row seat to history with us. Before we go tonight, the image of the day. Jane Pettit touching a portrait of her son during the unveiling of the 9-11 memorial wall at the Police Benevolent Association of New York City. Officer Pettit was killed on September 11, 2001 while attempting to rescue victims trapped inside the World Trade Center. That is our show for this hour. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're staying on top of a few things, including the surge in pediatric COVID cases, just as the major population centers in the East Coast return to the classroom. And our conversation with former tennis player Marty Fish about balancing your mental health needs while playing sports in the public glare and at the highest levels. It's an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcasts. powerful stories of our time anytime nightline now streaming on abc news live 2020 true crime cinematic real life drama stunning the unthinkable follow the clues the hunt true crime 2020 now streaming on abc news live Hey everyone, I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. We're monitoring several developments here at ABC News at this hour. Our weather team is tracking a low pressure system that has a moderate change of further development, chance of further development, and could bring more rain and flooding to the areas in the southeast. This is Hurricane Larry continues to churn near Bermuda, where a tropical storm watch is in effect. Authorities tonight are investigating how a six-year-old fell 110 feet to her death during a ride at a park in Colorado. The haunted mine drop at Glenwood Caverns Adventure touts itself as the world's first drop ride to go underground. The park is closed as of now. And two new identifications of victims of September 11th have been announced just days before the anniversary. Dorothy Morgan of Long Island is the 1,646th person identified and a man whose name is being withheld at the request of his family were identified using DNA analysis of unidentified remains. The medical examiner declared 20 years ago, we promised to do whatever it takes to identify loved ones and, quote, we continue to fulfill that sacred obligation. Now to the fallout tonight after that deadly flooding disaster and historic rain on the East Coast. President Biden visiting the metro New York area today to survey the damage and talk with affected residents, calling the destruction a, quote, eye-opener. Biden making it very clear storms like Ida show the threat from climate change is everybody's crisis. Our Whit Johnson reports. Tonight, President Biden touring disaster zones in New York and New Jersey, meeting with people whose lives were devastated by the remnants of Hurricane Ida. The losses uh, that we witnessed today are profound. The catastrophic storm killing at least 52 people in the Northeast alone, dropping historic rainfall in New York City, more than three inches falling in one hour. The president making the case that these extreme weather events require urgent action on climate change and calling this an opportunity to harden America's infrastructure. The evidence clear. Climate change poses an existential mm -hmm. threat to our lives, to our economy, and the threat is here. It's not going to get any better. The question, can it get worse? We can stop it from getting worse. But New York City still reeling from the horror of this storm. Many of the victims dying while trapped in flooded basements. The NYPD releasing this dramatic video showing the desperate effort to rescue a family, including a toddler in Queens. They did not survive. 
In New Jersey, where three tornadoes touched down and flooding destroyed homes, the search continues for at least four people swept away in raging water, including two college students, 18-year-old Nidhi Rana and 20-year-old Ayush Rana of Passaic. Missing for nearly a week, family members hoping for a miracle. Please pray for them, pray for them, please. Everybody pray for them. And nine days after Ida slammed into Louisiana as a monster Category 4 storm, then hard hit Golden Meadow. I've been here since 1966. Long time. 80 year old Gerald Louvier is yes. one of many residents yes. still vowing to rebuild. This is home, and it'll always be home. <laughs> Am I going to move? No. Just got to fight through it. And uh, we'll do it. All right, to fight through it. Our thanks to Whit Johnson for that. Now tonight to the concerning rise of COVID cases among children as doctors worry about a possible Labor Day surge. Marcus Moore reports. With millions of students going back to the classroom this week, health officials are warning COVID cases could skyrocket. Pediatric infections soaring to nearly 252,000 in just the last week, the biggest increase ever. We're calling this the fourth wave, but it has certainly been by far the most impactful surge, really hitting at children and adolescents. In Texas, where the governor has banned mask mandates in schools, a record number of children hospitalized with COVID. Oh, baby, don't cry. 11-year-old Brenna Gerganis wound up fighting for her life on a ventilator. She was too young to get vaccinated, and her mom says she got COVID just days after going back to her Texas classroom. Her lungs were going through hell. They've been doing breathing treatments on her every four hours. Thankfully, Brenna made it home where she is recovering tonight. COVID cases have already forced closures in at least 1,400 schools across 35 states this school year, and the battle over mask mandates still raging. No more masks! No more masks! We've got to get the school system masked in addition to surrounding the children with that with vaccinated people. That's the solution. But after Labor Day weekend saw big crowds and thousands packed into football stadiums, health officials are bracing for more outbreaks. I don't think it's smart. I think when you're dealing particularly in if you know outdoors is always better than indoors. But even when you have such a congregate setting of people close together, first, you should be vaccinated. And when you do have congregate settings, particularly indoors, you should be wearing a mask. The country now seeing nearly four times the number of COVID cases and double the number of hospitalizations than a year ago when there was no vaccine. But ICUs are now overwhelmed with unvaccinated patients. They're so sick, they actually can't breathe. And you see the fear in their eyes. Sometimes they mutter. I wish I would have been vaccinated. In northern Idaho, hospitals activating crisis care as a last resort, meaning life-saving equipment may not be available. And tonight, health officials are closely tracking a new variant, first identified in Colombia, called Mu, with mutations suggesting it could slightly evade vaccines. For now, the vaccines are still effective against it, but Mu has been confirmed in at least 16 states, with the most cases in California. While we have a concern that Mu could evade the vaccine, it's not spreading fast enough to be a real concern yet, but the jury is still out. A scientist keeping an eye on that new variant. Our thanks to Marcus for that. After months of debate and delay, Texas Governor Greg Abbott has signed it to law a highly controversial voting rights bill. Republicans there say it aims to ensure election security, while Democrats claim it unfairly targets minority communities in cities like Houston that often vote blue. Alex Perche has the latest from Washington. Texas's highly controversial voting rights bill now is law even after Democrats fled the state to keep it from passing. One thing that all Texans can agree, and that is that we must have trust and confidence in our elections. Called the Election Integrity Priority Bill, or SB1, state Republicans argue it makes it easier to vote by expanding the required early voting hours. Critics point to the law's added restrictions. It bans drive through and overnight early voting, something popular in heavily Democrat-leaning Harris County. It also adds new ID requirements for absentee voting. Although there was no evidence of widespread voter fraud in the 2020 election, both the governor and lieutenant governor claimed the bill will deter alleged cheaters from casting fraudulent votes. The Texas law, it does make it easier than ever before for anybody to go cast a ballot. It does also, however, however make sure that it is harder for people 
to cheat at the ballot box in Texas. Poll watchers will also have more free movement within a polling place, and election judges who obstruct them could face criminal penalties. The legislation will go into effect on December 3rd and is already being challenged in several lawsuits. The ACLU and others accusing Republican lawmakers of violating the Federal Voting Rights Act and intentionally discriminating against minorities. Texas is among at least 18 states that have enacted new voting restrictions since the 2020 election, according to the Brennan Center for Justice. State House Democrats now looking to the federal government saying in a statement we need the u.s senate to act immediately on the john lewis voting rights act our democracy depends on it our thanks to alex perche for bringing us that the tributes for the actor best known for his work as omar and the wire continue to pour in as tj holmes reports the death of michael k williams has struck a particular nerve omar isn't it he was the Emmy-nominated star best known for his role as Omar Little on the hit show, The Wire. Just like you, the man. culture of drugs. Excuse me? What? I got the shotgun. Got the briefcase. It's on the game, though, right? Police say they found Williams dead in his Brooklyn home on Monday. The death is being investigated as a possible drug overdose. The Wire creator wrote on Twitter that he was too gutted right now to say all that ought to be said. Michael was a fine man and a rare talent, and on our journey together, he always deserved the best words. And today, those words won't come. Williams has long been open about his struggles with sobriety, speaking to Tamron Hall earlier this year. A lot of people often think that when a person puts down the drug or the alcohol that all the problems go away. That, that couldn't be further from the truth. Uh, drugs and alcohol are not the problems. They're merely symptoms of the problem. His own personal struggles were often reflected in a story career spanning more than 25 years of work in television and film. Is Omar come back tomorrow? His famed character, Omar, a notorious stick-up man running the streets of Baltimore. The role gained him attention from even President Barack Obama, who called Williams' portrayal fascinating. After The Wire, Williams hit big again with another tough guy role, Chalky White, on the mob series Boardwalk Empire. Let's go, Buck. Chain running off nowhere. Williams racked up five Emmy nominations in his career. And you respect me! Including for his role as Montrose Freeman in the period sci-fi show Lovecraft Country and the Central Park Five depiction When They See Us. When the police want what they want, they will do anything. Do you hear me? Anything! When They See Us creator Ava DuVernay wrote on Instagram, Dear brother, be certain you were a flash of love, now gone, but never forgotten. The Wire co-star Wendell Pierce said Williams was an immensely talented man with the ability to give voice to the human condition, portraying the lies of those whose humanity is seldom elevated until he sings their truth. Michael K. Williams was 54 years old. So talented. Our thanks to T.J. Holmes for that. We turn now to athletes and mental health, an issue that has risen to prominence this summer with the public struggles of tennis star Naomi Osaka as well as U.S. Olympic gymnast Simone Biles, both of whom withdrew from major competitions, citing the challenging mental aspects of being world-class athletes. And tonight we speak with former top American tennis player Marty Fish, who faced his own battle with anxiety when he withdrew from the U.S. Open back in 2012 before a high-profile match with Roger Federer. His story is chronicled in the new Netflix documentary untold breaking point which premieres tonight here's a preview I had trained for my entire life I had to win every single time but I had a case of severe anxiety disorder was such an intense level of competitiveness all of a sudden my mind is a million places we weren't best friends we were brothers and I don't know that I completely understood what was going on to play the greatest player of all time. And my heart is just racing. I didn't know what to do. 100% perfect. I want to share my story so I can help. Marty Fish, kind enough to join us tonight. Marty, thank you for that. You know, it's certainly difficult, I think, for many people to understand the pressure that professional athletes face that goes certainly well beyond the physical. First, just take us through that moment for you back in 2012 when you were about to face world number one, Roger Federer, sitting in the car with your wife. And then what happened to cause you to not walk out on the court that day? Uh, th yeah, thank you for having me. No, it's... Um it's tough to watch that sometimes because it brings back a lot of um, a lot of those memories. And and you know, as athletes, we we've never um, you know we've never really been trained to 
give up or train to show weakness. Um, if we do, uh, you know, tennis specifically, we're always on the other side of the look on the other side of the court, and we've got. If I've got someone that's got their hands on their knees or something like that, I can um, see that they're hurting or they're tired or whatever, and that gives me more momentum. Um, and so we're sort of trained as a as a young athlete to um, to never show that weakness or show fear. Um, and so I was in the car headed there, and and you know in the depths of uh, severe uh, anxiety disorder or anxiety whatever at the time, I wasn't really sure what it was. Um, and my wife, thank God she was there. Um, and maybe I just needed a little woman's touch and someone who, um, you know, just didn't, maybe she didn't really understand, um, or, or know what I had sort of trained for my whole life. Um, uh, and she said, you, you know, you don't have to play. And it never would have crossed my mind. It didn't, it didn't cross my mind before. And it, I don't think it ever would have had she not been there or said that. Um, and so uh, thankful to her, um, she was an angel through this whole thing. It's so important to have a, a big support system. At the time, it was almost unheard of for a professional athlete to talk about their mental health. And we know that some stigma can, can still be prevalent today. What do you think has gotten better since you faced your own anxiety issues? And what still needs to improve for athletes? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I was a sports fan and have been a sports fan my whole life. So um, I wanted a success story to lean on um, when I was going through that process, um, you know, sort of getting my the process of getting my life back. Um, uh, you know, I was in, uh, in my house for months and months and months at a time, couldn't leave, uh, didn't feel comfortable leaving. Um, and so I, I followed sports, all sports, really, and, and um, uh, didn't have that sort of story that I could go, oh, yeah, I remember that athlete um, was uh, at the top of the game and was you know, sort of taken away with uh, some mental health issues, whatever it was, whether it be panic, depression, anxiety, whatever. And, um, and then they got back into it and they got to a high level, got back to a high level again. Um, and I, I, I didn't have that. I didn't, um, I didn't remember, I didn't know of any um, scenarios, situations where athletes have gone through something like that, at least vocally. Um, so I felt like if I told my story at the very least, um, it would give someone a success story that was in my position um, when I was going through it. And you've said that we need to stop making a distinction between mental health and physical health. Can you elaborate on that? Mental health doesn't care what you do for a living or what your name is or what your last name is. So um, everyone's bubble and world is its own um, and has its own stresses and anxieties. and. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't matter that I was a professional, you know, professional athlete doing doing this. Um, uh, and, and so I just, you know, I felt um, I felt like it was super important to um, to have them understand that when athletes walk around or when someone when anyone walks around, if you're a, a journalist or anything, you, you sprain your ankle, you walk around and you you're limping and you can see that um, you can't tell if somebody's struggling with mental health, um, even though I feel like it's a, you know, the brain is part of your body. After Naomi Osaka was, was knocked out of the U.S. Open this past week, she said that she plans to take a break from playing tennis. And I, I want to play something that she said in her post-match press conference. Recently, um, like when I win, I don't feel happy. I feel more like a relief. Um, and then when I lose, I feel very sad. And I don't, I don't think that's normal. What were you thinking when you watched that press conference and, and the various discussions surrounding the pressure in her career lately? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I can't, um, I can't pretend to understand the pressures that someone like her is going through. I mean, she's the, you know, she has a lot of, a lot of eyeballs on her. First of all, um, I can understand that, but but you know she's got a ton of sponsorships, and you know she's the the most marketable female athlete of all time. She's broken records in terms of how much uh, how much she's made off the court. So um, you know, tons of respect for her in in how she's gone about. Uh, Opening up, um, you know, trying, you know, telling people, trying to make people understand that um, sometimes it's not fun to talk to the press. Sometimes it's not fun to, um, you know, it's not all glamorous. And and tennis is a really um, 
a really difficult sport in terms of when you leave the locker room, you're all by yourself. I think she's handled it beautifully. And to be honest, I mean, um, she's, uh, she's sad. She's unhappy. She's, um, not comfortable playing right now. Um, and, and you can, you know, you can, you can see that, um, you can see it in her results, unfortunately. And then you can, um, you can see she's a sweet, um, shy person and not everybody's born for the spotlight like this. And it's important for people to understand she's a human. Um, and she's got those types of emotions. She can tell us what she's going through, but there's probably more things that she's dealing with. And, um, and, and I wish her nothing but the best. We're friends. We practice. We live here in, out here in Los Angeles. I, I try to take the court with her from time to time. She, she kicks my butt now. <laughs> um, so it's, you know, so I, I root for her like crazy and, and hope that she's, um, she just finds happiness. Marty Fish, we thank you so much for not just your time, but for sharing your story, which I, I think will have uh, a really positive impact on so many people who are suffering from anxiety, not just the professional athletes, but people in various walks of life. So we thank you and do want to remind our viewers that all five episodes of the documentary series Untold are available now on Netflix. And still to come, the suspect accused of stealing millions worth of jewelry and fleeing the heart of Paris on a scooter. And the women who were there at Ground Zero on 9-11, what they're still thinking about 20 years later. It was an extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed to report to prison to begin a 17-year sentence. They let him turn himself into jail with no escort. No one thought he would run. How do you evade capture for 25 years? How do you do that? Now, join the search, following the U.S. Marshals as they uncover new leads in a global manhunt. Can you help catch this fugitive? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Have you seen this man? Listen and join the all-new hunt wherever you get your podcast. The most powerful stories of our time Anytime. Nightline. Now streaming on ABC News Live 2020. True crime. Cinematic. Real life drama. Stunning. The unthinkable. Follow the clues. The hunt. True crime. 2020. Now streaming on ABC News Live. Admit it. These days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America? GMA 3, what you need to know. Now streaming on ABC News Live. It's all about you. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> I you. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 12 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. This is what being live is Bring all about. This is ABC News Live. All right, we're going to move back. Let's move back. We're surrounded this by people. Squeezing, squeezing into this bomb shelter. We're on an urgent delivery run. With Not afraid to go there. So my question, Mr. President, what are you so afraid of? Breaking news, live events. This is the moment. Lift off. <laughs> Streaming straight to you anytime, anywhere. You just met one friend right here. You're watching ABC News Live. Thanks for streaming with us. Everything was perfect until that moment. We couldn't see, and everything was just quiet. It's like a monster coming over you. Now, 20 years after, our world forever changed. Well, I told her, just get on my back. We just wouldn't give up. The women of 9-11 tell their whole stories. In that moment, I'm like, I didn't tell my family I love them. So please, don't let me tell. And now, the last survivor pulled from the rubble shares her story. I was just praying. What'd you say to God? Please give me a second chance. The powerful stories that unite these women are the things miracles are made of. Sorry.
Sorry, I just got, like, chills. Robin Roberts, The Women of 9-11. Wednesday night, September 8th on ABC and stream on Hulu. Welcome back. We're tracking several international headlines at this hour. Secretary of State Blinken says America is working around the clock to help about 100 Americans still stuck in Afghanistan to get out. The announcement came as the Taliban appointed members of a new government that included loyalists, hardliners, and no women. Two suspects have been arrested after an armed robber stole more than $2 million worth of jewelry and then fled on a scooter. Officials also say most of the money has been recovered. The suspects were detained near the French-German border. And Mexico's Supreme Court has voted unanimously to decriminalize abortion. This comes amid massive protests for women's rights and against domestic violence that have swept the world's second most populous Catholic country. And finally tonight, the strength and courage the women who were at Ground Zero 20 years ago have shown in the years since. As Robin Roberts shows us, these women have endured some of the worst experiences, but have emerged even stronger. My name is Nina Pineda. I'm a reporter at WABC-TV in New York, and I was a reporter covering Ground Zero on 9-11. We had never gone back and just kind of looked at that day, or we were just off and running for, for years. I reported on the eight-year anniversary and the 10-year anniversary. I couldn't even turn around and look at Ground Zero. It wasn't until year 15 that we could, felt like we could breathe. My name is Regina Wilson. I'm a New York City firefighter. And on 9-11, I was working at Engine Company 219 in Brooklyn, New York. I think 9-11 has shaken me so much to know that the unknown could alter my life so dramatically. It's unpredictable. My name is Judith Castro. I was a NYPD officer on the scene on 9-11. As the time gets closer to 9-11, we recall it like it was yesterday. Over the past 20 years, these women have rebuilt their lives in a most remarkable and inspirational way. One of these extraordinary stories is that of Janelle Guzman McMillan, the very last survivor pulled from the rubble of the World Trade Center. I had the opportunity to sit down with Janelle to hear her story firsthand. Uh, hi. Bless you. Bless you. Oh, uh, thank you. Oh, you look beautiful. Thank you. Oh. Wow. It's, it's, it's hard to believe it's been 20 years. 20 years, wow. It's like unbelievable. I'm still here. 31-year-old Janelle had taken a job with the Port Authority located on the 64th floor of the North Tower. As the North Tower collapsed, Janelle was still inside, buried under tons of concrete and rubble. It was dead silence. And I just lay there. And um, I was awake, but I knew it was pinned under there, and I knew that I'm just going to see myself slowly dying under here. It's going to take forever to dig all that rubble just to find me. And I was just praying and asking God to show me a sign or show me a miracle. What'd you say to God? Please give me a second chance. If you pull me out from this rubble, I promise I would do your will and I would change my life. So many were not given that second chance. We are so grateful that she was. We said that we would never forget, and all this week here on ABC and ABC News Live, we will be paying tribute to the lives lost and lives forever changed by 9-11. That is our show for tonight. Be sure to stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Have a good night. Extraordinary story. A computer salesman was supposed